Record 35, Side 1, Lesson number 35, the 35th lesson, Practical section. The British systems of coinage, weights and measures. Well, I haven't seen you two for some time. What have you been doing? I've been doing my best to solve financial problems, but not the kind that you are thinking of. How does one manage with all the various systems you use in this country for calculating? It seems rather mad to me. What do you think, Pierre? It's really a mystery to me why a country like the United Kingdom with all its ramifications abroad, should use what appears to countries under the metric system, a complicated and irrational collection of weights and measures, to say nothing of your monetary system. The question is an old one, and presumably has no answer which is comprehensive, nor, I feel, comprehensible to metric system countries. The system, although never perfect, may have had some justification in the past when Britain was the most influential country in the world. But in our modern world, it doesn't seem at all rational. I think the system is probably more easily explained than that. It was in use before the metric system, and at the time the latter was probably considered unworthy of attention. Just one of those new ideas. I grant you that, but why continue it? A pound has twenty shillings, and every shilling has twelve pence. What logical justification can there be for such a system of pounds, shillings and pence. It's complicated to multiply and divide or even to add or subtract sums of money. You're quite right, of course, and the vast majority of British people agree with you. However, the subject is not merely academic. For today, we are simply awaiting a definite decisive move from the government on this subject. Need it take so long, John? Other countries, for example, devaluate their currencies from one day to the next. Could a change such as we are discussing not be done in a similar short period? Today, industry and commerce must consider the cost of the change and make the necessary preparations. In devaluation, the coins very often remain the same in proportionate value. But in this case, the pound, shilling and penny will change their ratios one to the other, so the planning must be carefully done. I can see your argument, but why wasn't it done before? I believe that the change almost took place in 1916, and what a grand thing it would have been. It'll cost a great deal more now, won't it? Yes, but I've no idea how much more. It is necessary for the simplification of trade dealings and must be followed by the metric system of weights and measures too. That will be wonderful. Tradition dies hard, though. If there were not a great deal of necessity for this change, do you think Britain would do it even now? I can't answer that, really. I feel that all changes 
come about because there's some basic need which may occasionally force the issue. Don't you yourself agree that the metric system is better? How can you work with hundredweights, quarters, stones, and the pound, which has 16 ounces? Even your ton is different from the metric ton. I do agree with all you say. However, ours is a system which has served us well, and Britons have a habit of holding on to such things. Why don't they make the changeover all at the same time and have done with it? I suppose one reason is cost. A complete change might also create considerable confusion, mightn't it? Certainly, cost is an important factor which cannot be ignored. It could be the main reason for justifying a gradual change. Factories cannot throw out all their machinery overnight. And, after all, though you may find your system so simple, it doesn't follow that the British will find it so straightforward to walk kilometers instead of miles at first. What could be easier than ten times ten? And ten times a hundred? The decimal systems as simple as A, B, C. Yes, but when one has a set of values and is forced to change them, it takes a long time to grow accustomed to the new standards. I can see your point. Asking for a litre or half a litre of beer when you go to the pub for a drink will not sound quite right for a long time. But you already use litres and cubic centimetres in cylinder measurements for cars, don't you? I've heard the terms used, but have no great knowledge of their meaning. Can you tell me exactly how much a litre is? In pints, please. Side 2. Grammatical section. Nationalities. The names of countries, as well as the nouns and adjectives which are derived from them, are always written with a capital letter. It is important to remember this when writing the adjective. Most English books are well bound. There are some rules regarding the formation of these nouns and adjectives from the name of the country, so let us look at the various groups into which we may divide them. 1. Nouns ending in AN, ESE and double S have the same form for the adjective. The plural for those ending in AN is ANS. The others take no S. Name of country America, adjective American, noun American. Italy, Italian, Italian. Belgium, Belgian, Belgian. Japan, Japanese, Japanese. Switzerland, Swiss, Swiss. 2. Nouns which are formed by adding man or woman to the adjective. 
The plural is men or women. England, English, Englishman. France, French, Frenchwoman. Three. Nouns and adjectives having quite different forms. The plural is formed by adding S to the singular. Spain, Spanish, Spaniard. 4. Some examples are found of nouns being formed from the name of the country ending in land by adding ER. Iceland, Icelandic, Icelander. New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealander. With the exception of those ending in man and woman, the noun may be used indifferently both for masculine and feminine. If necessary, the word woman, lady or girl may be added for greater clarity when occasion requires. A Japanese girl, an Italian lady, a Russian peasant woman, a French dressmaker. When the general term for a people is required, it is sufficient to place the definite article before the plural noun in the first group. The Americans, the Chinese, the Hungarians, the Swiss. In the second group, the article is placed before the adjective. The English, the French, the Dutch, the Irish. Group 3 follows group 1 in using the noun in the plural preceded by the definite article to give the general sense of all. The Spaniards, the Turks, the Danes. Here is a list of the common names of some countries used every day and the adjectives and nouns deriving from them. Continents, Europe, adjective European, inhabitant European. Asia, Asiatic or Asian, Asian. America, American, American. Africa, African, African. Australia or Oceania, Australian, Australian. Countries, Austria, Austrian, Austrian. Belgium, Belgian, Belgian. Brazil, Brazilian, Brazilian. Canada, Canadian, Canadian. China, Chinese, Chinese. Denmark, Dane, Dane. England, English, Englishman. France, French, Frenchman. Germany, German, German. Greece, Greek or Grecian, Greek. Holland, Dutch, Dutchman. Hungary, Hungarian, Hungarian. India, Indian, Indian. Italy, Italian, Italian. Ireland, Irish, Irishman. Japan, Japanese, Japanese. Poland, Polish, Pole. Portugal, Portuguese, Portuguese. Russia, Russian, Russian. Scotland, Scottish or Scotch, Scotsman. Spain, Spanish, Spaniard. Sweden, Swedish, Swede. Switzerland, Swiss, Swiss. Turkey, Turkish, Turk. Wales, Welsh, Welshman. The adjective in all these categories, when used alone as a noun, indicates the language, hence French or the French language, English or the English language, Italian or the Italian language, German or the German language, Russian or the Russian language. Words and expressions. It is, it was. Notice the expressions, it is I, it was the milkman. Who was it? It is they who say we are wrong. In this last example, the impersonal form is used to give emphasis or make the word they more prominent. Neither nor, either or, not only but also, both and, if then, not but, as so, 
on the one hand, on the other hand. These expressions, used in pairs, give, when used moderately, extra life to a sentence. In order to understand the full meaning of the phrase, the reader must wait till he has read what comes after the second form, and so there is a feeling of suspense. Neither the old man nor his son, who had not been to school, could read the letter. They said we must either go now or lose the opportunity forever. We heard that not only was he a fool, but also a troublemaker. Both the lady and her daughter go to church every Sunday. If you study really hard, then you may pass your exam. Leaving the car there was not only silly, but costly. I had to pay a fine. As you sow, so shall you reap. On the one hand there was the grave risk, on the other the chance of a wonderful fortune. While we are thinking of words used in pairs, it might be useful to take note of a number of expressions which, for emphasis, repeat the same idea twice. English is full of them, but the form is perhaps not so common in other languages. Leaps and bounds, fair and square, free and easy, heart and soul, house and home, intents and purposes, null and void, head and ears, safe and sound, time and tide, well and good.